Praise the Lord. We welcome you this evening. Glad that you're here to worship the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. We want to welcome those that are here for the first time. If this is your first time, if you raise your hand, praise the Lord. There's a brother back there. We're glad you've come. We welcome you. Praise the Lord. Hope you'll take the time to read the good news for you that he just gave you. It's a 12-page publication sharing the gospel of Jesus as our Savior and receiving the Holy Spirit and healing and deliverance and things that God wants to accomplish in your life. Praise God. We're going to receive our offering as we bring up our tithes and offerings unto the Lord. Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to bring up tithes and offerings unto you. We give freely, we give excitedly, we give because we want to. We know that as we sow that you're multiplying that seed sown. We thank you and Father, Father that you are causing all grace to abound toward us, that we have all sufficiency in all things and may be able to abound to every good work. Father, we thank you for meeting the need of every individual in this place according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, wait on the people if you would, please. Praise God. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Our regular service times are Sunday at 10, Sunday evening at 6.30, Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We also have intercessory prayer on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. We have outreach ministry where we go out passing out the gospel, preaching the gospel on the streets, talking to people about Jesus on Friday and Saturday nights. And we also have deliverance on Saturdays where we minister deliverance and healing. And we make appointments with people and work with you to continually minister to the areas of need in your life. And just want you to be aware of the things that we do, praise God. Yes, there's information in there on the, a lot of that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to pray for all men, then we're going to pray for our nation. Please agree with me. Heavenly Father, we pray for every person who has never received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. We bind the devils that have deceived the multitudes from receiving Jesus. Father, we thank you that you desire for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You're not willing that any should perish. Father, we thank you for revealing the truth through the Word of God regarding what Jesus has accomplished, that He has redeemed us, that He is the one who is the Savior of the world, who paid the price, who has been raised from the dead as alive forevermore. Thank you for bringing that revelation to all those that have not been born again. Father, thank you for showing them that you're not holding their sins against them. And thank you for showing them that you're convicting them of one sin. It's the sin of not believing on Jesus. Thank you for bringing them to repentance that they would receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior and be born again. Thank you, Father, for the multitude of souls coming to the Lord in these last days. <clears throat> Father, we do pray for this nation as well. Father, we just thank you and praise you that you are raising up the righteous that would walk in the, your ways, that would pray and seek you. And Father, Father, you said that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, you'd hear from heaven, you forgive us our sins and you heal our land. It all depends upon what your people do. We are your people. And we pray for all the people of God, all the born again believers to rise and begin to pray diligently. And we thank you and praise you for moving mightily to bring forth what you purpose. We remit the sins and iniquities of this nation from its founding to this moment. We bind all the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. We cast them down, throw them down, root them out, fall upon them to their destruction. Father, we thank you for moving mightily to bring forth what you purpose in this nation, a restoration to righteousness. Thank you for shaking this nation, doing whatever is necessary to bring it to repentance. Father, we praise you for the mighty work that you're doing to restore this nation to righteousness. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. <coughs> Stand with me if you would. We're going to pray as we get into God's Word this evening. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your Word, which is the truth. We do receive your Word written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. Hebrews chapter 6, 
in verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith towards God, of doctrine of baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. These ones, these six things that it mentions here, are foundational principles that are to be established in every one of us. Repentance from dead works. A godly sorrow that works repentance so we'll turn away from all dead works that are profitless, that are all going to be burned up, going to cause us to suffer loss, that we're going to give account of before God, that are going to give place to the enemy through sin. We want to turn away from them and only do the things that God wants. A faith towards God. We must walk by faith, not by sight. We have the spirit of faith. We have the faith of Jesus. You and I are to believe the Word of God and to walk in faith and take hold of the promises with thanksgiving. And our faith is to grow exceedingly. And our faith is to be used to move our mountains. And we're to use our faith to destroy the works of the enemy and to see God accomplish all that He wants because our faith is our servant. It's what we're to work that will bring forth the promises of God in our life. The doctrine of baptisms. Doctrine of baptisms that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is what brought us into the new birth, immersing, which is what the word baptism means, the immersing of the presence of the Holy Spirit in which at that point in time the Holy Spirit took the old spirit out, put the new spirit in when we received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. That's when we got born again, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, brought us into the body of Christ and we're born again. And then the baptism, it's plural because there's another baptism, it is water baptism, which is showing forth what happened on the inside of us when we received Jesus, as it is showing the fact that the old us is dead and gone and there's a brand new us on the inside of us. It also is significant that we are to have water baptism to the w showing forth to the world that we have left the world, that we belong to Jesus, that we're born from above, we're not of this world any longer that we've come out of the ways of the world and now we are a priest before God and we're going to walk in His ways and follow Him all the days of our life. And then it comes down, it talks about the resurrection of the dead, the fact that those are all, the dead are going to be resurrected. There'll be those of the righteous dead and those will be the unrighteous dead. The ones that are the righteous dead, they're going to be resurrected. They're going to get a glorified body. They are going to go into life eternal with the Father while those that are the unrighteous dead, they are going to be brought before the th white throne judgment and their works are going to be declared and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. There is a judgment that is going to come and the last one, eternal judgment. There's an eternal judgment that everyone must realize that, that we're not just living a life just for this short time. We are training for what's going to happen in the future. This is proving time. This is testing time. This is the spiritual wilderness to show whether we're going to walk with the Lord and follow Him or not. Because there is a judgment. There is a judgment seat of Christ that we all will stand before and give account before God. And if we will, of course, walk with the Lord, then we will have a good report. We will go on to be with the Lord. The one that we didn't talk about yet was, it's in this list, is the one about laying on of hands. Tonight we're going to talk about the doctrine of the laying on of hands. It is a doctrine of the church. It is something that you and I must understand. It's not just something that you know, we just decide to do on our own. It's actually a doctrine of the church. Hands are significant in scriptures, in the scriptures. Many things are done with the hands. God wants you to realize that your hands are to be used of the Lord to accomplish the things that He purposes. In Exodus chapter 29, verse 10, it said, Thou shalt cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. In the Old Testament, they would lay their hands on the head of the bullock. What was the purpose? The purpose was that they were going to kill this bullock and they were going to bring this as a sacrifice. It says here, that this, what they brought, this bullock, the skin, and all the things they brought, it was the sin offering that they brought before the Lord. So they were laying hands on this and imparting their sins unto this, and then they were bringing the sin offering before the Lord 
as the blood was being shed. The animals was just simply for the covering over of sin in the Old Testament era. We see further down here that it talks about they took the other ram in verse 19, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram, and they would kill the ram and take of the blood, put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, upon the tip of the right ear of the sons, upon the thumb of the right hand, upon the great toe of their right foot, and sprinkle blood upon the altar round about. This was when they were consecrating the priest to the ministry, and they laid hands upon that one with the blood being shed and applied it to these areas of the ear, the thumb, and also the right foot. Those are the things that you and I sin with. We would sin with our ears, we would sin with our hands, we would sin with our walk. And so the blood had to be applied to that because the blood will cleanse us from sin, showing the fact that the lay on of hands, the fact that we do, will sin, they did sin with their members, and they needed to be cleansed. You and I, of course, need to also be cleansed from all of our sins that we would yield to with our members. Of course, God does not want to yield our members unto sin. He wants us to yield unto God and yield to an obedience to produce righteousness in our life. But the laying on of hands was transferring something, notice. It was laying on of hands transferring the sin so then they could be covered over. It was laying on of hands was for the consecration of the ministry so that then they could go forth and carry out the ministry of the Lord. We see in Leviticus, in chapter 16, Leviticus chapter 16, in verse 5, here's where it speaks of the two, two goats, the two kids of the goats that were a sin offering, and there was a ram for a burn offering. And it speaks in verse 8 that Aaron would cast lots upon the two goats. One lot was for the Lord, the other lot was a scapegoat. He would bring the goat upon the, which the Lord's lot fell, offer him for a sin offering. The goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him, to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Then we come down to verse 15. Then he kills the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, brings his blood within the veil and doeth the blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. But then we see down in verse 21 what they do with the live goat. Aaron will lay hands, both his hands, upon the head of the live goat. What's laying on of hands going to do? It's going to transfer something. It's going to release something. It's going to transmit something. Confessing over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send them away by the hand of a fit man in the wilderness. Of course, this is all a type of what happened with Jesus. Jesus was going to have all of the sins laid upon him and he was going to go as the live goat down into hell for three days and three nights to bear away those sins. And that's exactly what he did. But it's interesting, we see that the laying on of hands is the way that they showed the transmission of the sins going into that goat because that's the way they would re show forth a release or a transfer of things. Laying on of hands brings a transfer of something. It is a doctrine of the church and is important for you to understand. It will transfer things. We see over in Numbers, chapter 8, in verse 10. Numbers 8, verse 10. They brought the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites. What were the Levites? They were the priests, and they were to be the ones who were going to serve God. So they were laying their hands on them for what? For the service of the Lord. And it says, that it, was, it says so here, they offered the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel that they may execute the service of the Lord. Laying on of hands was done in the Old Testament to consecrate and dedicate people for the service of the Lord. Levites to lay their hands upon the head of the bullocks and offer one, the one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering of the Lord to make an atonement for the Levites. Again, they lay their hands on all these sacrifices in order to transfer the sins and they'd offer them up. That's the way the sins were being transferred through that. And then they would offer up and that would be a the blood would be shed. And it would be a covering over for sin in the Old Testament era. We see over in Numbers chapter 27. We begin over in verse 16. He said, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. In the Old Testament, they set a man over the congregation just as God does that in the New Testament as well. Which may go out before them, 
which may go in before them, which may lead them out, which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Otherwise, they're to have someone that's going to feed them, that's going to lead them, that's going to help minister to them in order to bring forth the Word of God to them and lead them in the right path. And that's, of course, what one is to do over a congregation. The Lord said unto Moses, Take the Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, lay thine hands upon him. They were laying their hands on Joshua. And what was he going to be? He was going to be the one that was going to lead them. Set him before Ele Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and give him a charge in their sight. Someone who has hands laid upon him, he is going to be consecrated for ministry and he is to be given a charge or a command of what he's to do. He just doesn't do whatever he wants. He's given a charge in their sight. Commands, orders are given to him. And he's got to carry out the orders that are given unto him. Thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. They were to follow and walk in the ways of the Lord. You would stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim. Urim here, which means lights, was it talks about these stones that were kept in a pouch on the high priest's breastplate. What this was all about. It was something that was they were to have that was to be used in determining God's decision in certain questions and issues. Otherwise, it was to give them wisdom to be able to make right decisions. Light would come to them to give them wisdom to know what to do. So we'd ask counsel for the judgment of Urim before the Lord. And at his word they shall go out. At his word they shall come in. Both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. There was an, they laid their hands on him, and there was an anointing that came upon that person for the service of the Lord, for the ministry of the Lord, to carry out what God purposed. Moses did as the Lord commanded him, took Joshua, set him before Eleazar the priest, for all the congregation. He laid his hands upon him, and he gave him a charge, a command, as the Lord commanded by the hands of Moses. That tells you that God will set people in ministry who have come to the place of been called by God, and when he does, when they have proven themselves that they are ready for the ministry and they have a call of God, and he's going to give them a ministry gift that's going to be imparted unto them, and the laying on of hands sets them into that ministry. That is true in the New Testament as well. And it says that is also that they gave them a charge. Those ones who are set in the ministry are commanded, they're given orders to carry out what God says. I recall way back in 1980 when I finished Bible school and I was one of six of the class who were set to be ordained into the ministry and they called the six of us forward and we went forward and we were, had hands laid upon us to be an ordained into the ministry and a charge given to us that we were to preach the gospel and when hands were laid upon me as you set someone ministry there will be an impartation if you have been called by God and if it's God who is doing this and bringing this ministry gift into you. And that's exactly what happened to me. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I went up there and I came back a different person because I knew, I felt the impartation, sometimes you do, of the ministry gift that came in. It was through the laying on of hands that God imparted that and I was a different person when I came back to my seat and I knew that God had set a ministry gift within me. I didn't know what all I was going to do, but I just knew that he'd done something and set me and ordained me into the ministry. Real things will happen when God's the laying on of hands and God has anointing come upon you for the ministry of the Lord. And of course, the thing is that many pastors might have been set in the ministry, but they got to take heed to the command, the charge, the orders. They can't just do what they want to do. They can't decide how I'm going to do something. No, we, our command, our orders are to study the Word, to teach the Word, to not compromise, to carry out the ministry, to lead and guide and, and do everything that God has called us to do and not to do whatever we want to do. We've got to lead in line with the Word of God. And that's very important. We see something else over in Deuteronomy in chapter 34. Deuteronomy 34. Verse 9, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded him. 
Notice Moses had laid his hands upon him, and it says that the spirit of wisdom came upon him. God will give wisdom to those that he sets in positions of ministry. A spirit of wisdom will operate, show them what to do. Of course, they've got to listen to the Lord. They've got to get the word in them. They're going to have to choose the way of the Lord and be obedient to do what he says. But notice, the laying on of hands caused this impartation of a spirit of wisdom to know what to do to carry out the ministry of the Lord. Laying on of hands releases spiritual things into you. It will release spiritual things. It will impart things. It will bring forth things that God wants to put upon a person or to impart into that person. We see another scripture over in 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, we pick up over in verse 32. When Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child. He put his mouth upon his mouth, eyes upon his eyes, hands upon his hands, stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. He not only put his hands on him, he put his whole body on top of him, mouth to mouth, hands to hands, eyes to eyes, exactly on top of him. And what happened? There was an impartation of the power of God and the Spirit of God that went into him through that contact and transmission of laying upon him. And the flesh of the child waxed warm. He was raised from the dead. He returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up, stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. I say, what would that seven times sneezing be? What happens when breath comes out of us? Demons come out of us. Seven spirits must have come out of him, of death or whatever all was in him, and they sneeze out, they cough out, all kinds of ways. These spirits certainly must have left and come out of him. And the child opened his eyes. The demons had to have left him. And he was now raised from the dead alive because of the contact, laying on of hands or the contact of releasing the anointing through your body that will reside in there brought forth the raising of the dead. And he called Gehazi, and he said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was coming unto him, he said, Take up thy son. She went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. He was raised from the dead. The anointing of God is to come into us. The power of God is to come into us. The faith of God is to come into us. The wisdom of God is to come into us. All these things, the God's might is to be into us so that then it can be released through us that we would do the mighty, marvelous works of the Lord. That's what God wants to bring forth. Hands are that which releases things. In the Old Testament even, this is in the laying on of hands, but shows you what hands will do. We see in Psalms 9, there were two Hebrew words for praise in the Old Testament. It says in Psalms 9 about how I'll praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth thy marvelous works. The word praise here is this word yada. And yada is the word normally for praise, but it means to release something, to throw something out, to cast something forth from you, to release something for you, from you. It can be translated to shoot something forth or to throw something forth. And they were releasing the power of God, or releasing, in this case, sometimes it was the power of God. In this case, they were releasing praise unto the Lord. And it was with the uplifted hand. Yada was the extended hand reaching out to God, releasing the praise and worship unto Him. God wants us to be praisers and worshipers of Him as well. He said, I'll be glad and rejoice in Thee. I will sing praise to Thy name. He said, my, when my enemies are turned back, they'll fall and perish at Thy presence. Because the presence of God came as He worshiped God. But He released it with His hands, releasing, throwing out praise unto God. It brought the manifestation, the presence of God, and caused those enemies to be turned back. There's another word for praise. It was the word tauda. This particular word, example of this, is where it was an extension of hand in adoration to the Lord, and this was receiving. The one was throwing out power. The other is receiving something from the Lord. We see in Psalms 50, verse 14, where it says, Offer unto God thanksgiving, tauda. 
and pay thy vows unto the Most High. They would offer up thanksgiving. What do we offer up thanksgiving for? Not only for the things he's done, but for the thing, in order to take hold of the promises of God. And we see this again used in a song that we sing here. Psalms 50, verse 23. We sing this, and we sing this key of C songs. Whoso offereth praise, tout awe, glorifieth me. And to him that orders his conversation or his way aright will I show the salvation of God. As you're offering up thanksgiving and praise unto him, which is lifting up your hand to take hold of the promises, he will bring salvation, as salvation of God. He will show himself unto us. It shows the fact that the lifted hand has something special to God as it is releasing something from you. We see that. It's very important. We even see a scripture over in uh, Psalms 141. Psalms 141 in verse 2. See, the devil doesn't want you to lift your hands unto God, but God wants you to lift your hands unto him. It's releasing something from you, see. Hands release things. Psalms 141, verse 2, Let my prayer be set forth as before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice, a sacrifice of praise unto God. Lifting up your hands, releasing praise and worship unto God. Don't let the devil stop you from lifting up your hands unto God. You know, religious spirits don't want you to do that. First, think about when you first got born again and you got around people maybe that were lifting up their hands and you, what is all this about, you know? You weren't used to doing that. You know, you kind of felt funny about it. It took a while to kind of, you're, you kind of went through the different stages of uh, 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 trying to get those up, you know, and you finally get your hands up, you know? Those religious spirits don't want you to release praise and worship unto God. But it's God wants you to do so. And you must realize, why does the devil fight against that? Because he doesn't want you to release praise and worship unto him. Hands are releasers, you must understand. It's shown in the Old Testament. Psalms 119, verse 48. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments. Lifting up the commandments that I'm going to do your commands. That I'm going to obey your commands. I'm going to honor your word, which I've loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. That shows that the hands are not only lifting up praise unto him, but also lifting up to him, releasing the fact and honoring him and declaring, I'm going to do your commandments. I'm going to follow your word. I'm going to honor your word. I'm going to meditate in it. I am going to do what your word says. That's what God wants. He wants us to lift up our hands unto the Lord and release praise and worship and glorify him and put him first place. When we come over to the New Testament, as we've already seen that hands are transmitting something, transferring something, releasing something in some capacity when our hands are involved, are involved. And this is a doctrine of the church. So it's something very important. But we come over to Mark in chapter 10. And we see in verse 13. They brought young children to him, speaking of Jesus, that he should touch them. Remember, Jesus would touch them with his hands. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. When Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. He said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, shall not enter therein. He took them up in his arms, and he put his hands upon them, and he blessed them. Jesus would put his hands upon them and bless them. He would release blessing. Put laying on of hands will release the blessing of God coming through you into another person as you pray for them or you just lay hands upon them. Jesus would release blessing into them. So when you lay hands on people, you are release, you're to release blessing to come into them. This is why, of course, you only lay hands on those that are born again and right with God. You do not lay hands upon those that are not born again to release blessing because they're not in covenant relationship with God yet. You do not release uh, things into people that are not walking right with the Lord. If they're walking in known sin, they need to come to the place of repentance first. We see another scripture over in Matthew. <coughs> Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, 
When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And what did Jesus do? He put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Notice Jesus spoke, answering his question, I will. But how did he release it? He said, he put forth his hand and touched him. And he spoke words. You see, you're going to release things with words and also through your hands releasing it. He said, be clean, but he also touched him to release that power of God to flow forth into that person. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. That shows you that healing will flow through your hands. It's not you, it's God flowing through you. As you are releasing the power of God, as you're acting upon the Word of God, you and I are to go forth and to bring healing to the sick. We see another case in Matthew 8. It's over in verse 14. In this case, it says, When Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid sick of a fever. It says he touched her hand and the fever left her. That meant something had to have come out of his hand. Power, virtue, power went out of his hand and knocked that fever out of her and ministered unto him. In this case, it only says that he touched her. You know, in order to see what all happened in any situation, you always got to look at all the other ones that are recorded about the subject, especially in the other Gospels. And we need to look over in Luke chapter 4 to see in the other accounts, Luke chapter 4, in verse 38, we see the same situation. He arose out of the synagogue, entered into Simon's house, and Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. He stood over her, and he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Here it doesn't say anything about laying on of hands. Here it just says he just rebuked that fever. He just commanded that thing to go. The other one says he laid hands, but that shows you what he really did, because he did both. He rebuked the fever and laid hands upon her, as you look at both together. The one just gave the one account from Matthew's viewpoint. The other one just gave Luke's account. But what we see is that he did lay hands upon him and released power. Learn to speak forth and also lay hands on a person to release the healing power of God to flow into them, to bring healing to them. We see back in Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5, the doctrine of laying on of hands. Here we see the case in verse 22 of Mark 5. Behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, she shall live. Hey, he had quite a reputation. They knew what he would, just lay your hands. They knew what happened when he'd lay hands on them that healing power would flow into people. Just come and lay your hands on her. Because they knew that healing would flow forth. God wants you to know you got hands that can release the healing power of God, the anointing of God that can bring forth healing into people. And so, of course, Jesus went with them. Much people followed him and thronged him. At that point, the moment of the issue of blood came. We'll come back to that in a minute. But after that situation had been concluded in verse 35, while he yet spake, there came a ruler of the synagogue's house, certain which said, Thy daughter's dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Ah, otherwise, give up. It's all over. No, no, no not going to happen now. Well, as, Jesus, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. You believe the word of God. Don't yield to what the enemy has done. The enemy had brought the death of the child. He knew she was already at the point of death. In fact, he said that she might be healed and she might live, so he knew that it's possible that she could die anyway. He said, Be not afraid, only believe. So, suffered no man to follow him, except for Peter and James and John, the brother of James, and they come to the house. And when they came in, they said, The damsel's not dead, but sleepeth. He wouldn't even confess the fact that she was dead. They laughed him to scorn, of course, but he put them all out, except for the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and they entered in where the damsel was lying. He took the damsel by the hand, and as he touched her hand, and then he said words, so we have a combination of the touch as well as the words. Talitha kumai, which being interpreted, is damsel, I say unto thee, arise. 
And straightway the damsel arose and walked. For she was the age of twelve years. They were astonished with a great astonishment. He spoke words, but he also released power by grabbing her hand. That shows you that hands are going to release the power of God. But you still need to speak it, but you also want to release it. Speak it and then release it through your laying on of hands to minister healing power to flow into people. We go back to the woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. She had this issue of blood for 12 years, and she'd suffered many things and many physicians. She'd spent all that she had. She was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse because it didn't, solve, didn't deal with the problem that was there. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. The garment that it talks about was a little thing that they had, like a tzitzit or a little tail thing that would hang down from their, from their garment. And it was a reminder of the promises of God. That's why they would carry that. And so he touched that garment. And she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole, because she knew the promises of God. So she touched that. She was reminding of the promises of God, which was going to take hold of that promise as she was touching that. And so as she touched him, what happened? Straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. See, she had said, I shall be whole. She had faith. She just needed to touch him to receive that healing power to flow forth out of him. So she did so, and she was healed of that plague. Now Jesus, he didn't know what happened as far as who did it, but he knew that power went out of him. He could apparently feel or sense the spiritual power of God go out of him. Jesus immediately knowing himself that virtue, the word virtue is dunamis. It's the Greek word dunamis, as you see below, which means power. Power had gone out of him. Turned about the press and said, who touched my clothes? Now, he's talking about someone who touched him with faith and received power, not someone who just happened to brush up against him. The disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? They're just thinking of brushing up against him. No, Jesus is talking about someone who touched him to receive from him. That shows you that he looked around about the seer that had done this thing. We can touch him receiving the healing power of God as we speak forth and declare what he will do for us. The woman, fearing, trembling, knowing what was done her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And she said, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. So here she touched him. Well, you can spiritually touch the Lord through the word of God and take hold of those promises of God yourself as you speak forth and declare what he will do for you. In fact, you speak it into being now in the New Testament, declaring what he is doing for you as you take hold of it with your faith and bring it into manifestation. We see in Mark chapter, or in Mark chapter 6 then, we come, and it says in Mark 6, 1, he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. The Sabbath day was come here, he came to teach in the synagogue. Many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by what? By his hands. Not through his words, but by his hands. They saw these great mighty works. Jesus was laying hands on people every place. A lot of times you just see him speaking the word and preaching the gospel, but you've got to understand, Jesus was laying hands on these people that's why he said, come and lay your hands on her. They, they'd seen what he'd done. He said, he's done such mighty works by, the, by his hands. Well, Jesus has come to dwell in us, and one of the doctrines of the church is the laying on of hands. He wants you to be aware that he's going to use you through the laying on of hands to release and transmit healing power and deliverance and anointing and blessing into people's lives. You want, need to know that. You need to be aware of that. You need to have faith in that when you do so, that you are releasing the power of God to flow into people. Now, is that going to happen every time automatically? No. When he's near at Nazareth, he is. Remember, they were in unbelief. And in verse 5, it says, He could there do no mighty work. He couldn't do it there. Jesus couldn't do a mighty work. That's right. He was hindered. Why? Save that he laid his hands, he was still laying hands, on a few sick folk and healed them. There must have been a few that believed there. But he couldn't do any mighty works. 
which means what was going on in the overall attitude of the people was hindering him from doing much of anything. He marveled because of their unbelief. See, he could not do mighty works because of unbelief. You cannot lay hands on someone and impart something to them and think that it's going to go into them if they're in unbelief. They must believe. They must be in faith. It's not going to be automatic. They must be in faith to receive that which you are going to minister unto them. And so that's another important thing. That's why you want to always pre preach the gospel to people, give them the teaching, be sure they're in faith, be sure they're right with God before you go to minister to them. A lot of people have a tendency to just want to pray for them. They, and how, how do I know where that person's at? Do you believe the scriptures? Do you know, have you confessed your sin? Are you right with God? Do you know that healing power will flow into you? Do you know what God will do? Or you just want me to pray for you and hope maybe something will happen? Are they really in faith? Are they really, do they really have hope and confident expectancy? You need to spiritually locate them. Many people just go and pray for them. And they know, you know, that's all they do. They just do this without really locating them. That's a mistake. We need to know, do, find out what they, where they're at. And, of course, you want to get the gospel to them to bring them to the place of believing. If they're in unbelief, you're not going to see anything happen. Jesus couldn't do anything. You think we can do anything? No, nothing. Because unbelief will hinder the effects of the laying on of hands to release and transmit the power of God. It's not automatically going to go into a person. In Mark chapter 7, we see over in verse 32, <coughs> they brought, bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. Again, get your hand on him. They knew it because he was laying his hands on everybody. You've got to realize that he did this every place he went. They took him aside from the multitude, put his fingers in his ears. Now remember, what was his problem? He's deaf, he couldn't hear. Impediment in his speech. He had a problem going on in his mouth. So, what does he do? do? He puts his fingers in his ears. That's his hand going into his ears where the deafness was. He spit and touched his tongue. He's touching the area where he wasn't able to speak. What's he doing? He's releasing power and healing and anointing that is going into him. He looked up to heaven, he sighed, and he spoke to him, which means be opened. He also spoke words. It's not just laying on hands only. <clears throat> when you see Jesus doing this, he also spoke words, commanding words to release that promise. And the, he the healing was simply the point, the point of contact with his hands or whatever was just releasing that which he spoke to come into him through that vessel. His hands being a vessel to transmit the healing power of God. He said, be open. And straightway his ears were open, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. The healing power of God goes in. So you're going to speak the word and also lay hands on them to release the healing power to flow into them at the same time. That's important for you to learn and understand if you're going to be effective in doing the things that God wants for you to do. Praise God. Now, over in Mark chapter 8, we see something else. Mark chapter 8, pick up at verse 22. He comes to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. <clears throat> They're always wanting to touch him, aren't they? It wasn't just, just speak the word. Every, in fact, most of the cases, they always wanted to touch him. They didn't even really talk about speaking, did they? Because you've got to get aware. There's something going to flow through your hands. You've got to get faith in the fact that God's power will flow through you. It's a doctrine of the church. It besought him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand, he's got contact with him now, and led him out of the town. When he spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, now he's releasing something, he asked him if he saw aught. Healing power went flowing into him. He says, he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Before he couldn't see a thing. Now he's seeing something, but he's not, certainly not seeing clear yet. What does that tell you? The power of God went into him, but it didn't accomplish everything. That tells you that power needs to be released <coughs> continuously until you see the desired results. So what did Jesus do? He put his hands again upon his eyes. Well, what was, why did he need to do that? Because the first time it didn't accomplish the whole work. It only accomplished part of it. That shows that you and I continue to minister to a person until we see the results. The power of God went in. 
it caused a change. This time, now, his hands were put upon him again on his eyes, made him look up, and he was restored, and he saw every man clearly. This shows you something. The fact that when you go to minister to people, you're going to minister to them continually until they see the victory, and you're going to lay your hands on them to release healing power to flow into them, or anointing, and you continue to pray for them until you see the desired results. Of course, there have been people out there that have taught, unfortunately, in particular circles, word, it was called, referred to as Word of Faith Circle type churches, that you only pray one time. If you pray more than one time, you're in doubt and unbelief. That is erroneous teaching. Do not listen to this lying teaching. Jesus prayed more, or laid hands on him more than once. Oh, that'd be a no-no in word of faith circles. Oh, how could you do that? You must have been doubt and unbelief the first time, Jesus. No, Jesus was never in doubt and unbelief. He released power the first time, didn't do the whole job. What do you do? You release it again. It's common sense, spiritual sense. You just keep releasing the power of God so you see the results. The Bible says we pray without ceasing. We speak to the mountain continually. We cast out continually. We speak, pray the prayer of faith continually. We release the power of God continuously until we see the promises of God come to pass. We see something else in Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> in verse 18, it talks about again in the doctrine of the church. It says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You're to go forth and preach the gospel. You're also, remember, to cast out the demons, the verse before says, but you're also going to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In fact, when you're ministering deliverance to a person, you really want to do both. You want to cast out the demons, but also lay hands on them. And when you're laying hands on them, your faith is to be not only releasing anointing as you're casting out the demons, but also releasing healing power flowing into them at the same time. It does, you don't have to say anything, as it says here. They didn't say anything here. They just laid hands on them, and it brought healing power flowing into them. So whenever you're laying hands on them, no, you're not just going through formality. You're releasing the power of God. You need to have your faith in what you're doing, that you are releasing the power of God that's going to flow into that person. Here's another case. Matthew chapter 14. Verse 29, here's Peter walking on the water. When Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30, when they saw the wind, when he saw the wind boisterous, the word boisterous means it was mighty and forceful. It's this word iskeros, which means mighty and forceful, or, or strong, great strength. Or Young brings it vehement, meaning it was very mighty and forceful. When he saw this wind mighty and forceful, and you say, well, that devil stirred that up, that's right. Does that mean that that's going to cause you to fall or get out and, or not see you're going to walk in the way of the Lord and see God's power work? No. God's power will work regardless of what the devil's doing. But what happened? It's the way he reacted, the way he reacted to what the devil did. He was afraid. When you get in fear and you get out of faith, uh, you're not going to be seeing God's power working anymore. Now you're just going to shut down the power. What began? What happened? He began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. At least he had the sense to do that. So what did Jesus do? Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, his hand reaching out to him. And he said, O thou little faith, <coughs> wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they're coming the ship, the wind ceased. So here it says he just caught him. doesn't mean he brought him into the ship. He just caught him. Who knows whether he walked back into the the on the water or not. It doesn't say. But one thing, he reached out with his hand and it caught him and stopped him from sinking. The power of God went up and obviously he didn't sink. He came back into the ship. Power will be released through the laying on of hands. Jesus didn't just speak words. He reached out and touched him with his hands. Jesus would do this every place he went. In fact, Jesus didn't just lay hands on a few people. Look what it says here in Luke chapter 4, verse 40. Now the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. I mean, who knows how many people there were. He just kept lay laying his hands on every single one of them, and every one of them got healed. And devils also came out of many, crying out, 
he was also obviously casting the demons out of those ones as he was laying hands on them. And you cast the demons out as he commanded them to come out. And they were saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the God, and rebuking them. He suffered not them to speak. So he was casting them out. And he, of course, he didn't want them to tell who he was. Jesus would minister the power of God through speaking words and laying hands on someone. We also see in Luke chapter 13, another case, over in verse 11. Here was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. The word had is the word to, means held by. She was held by. It's the same word translated possessed over in Acts chapter 8, verse 7. We can show you that. Notice this word, echo. Echo. And you'll see number 2192. We'll come back here in a moment. It could have been translated possessed just as well because it's the same word. In Acts chapter 8, verse 7, when unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. Here's the word. Echo number 2192. They were possessed with them. Why they didn't translate it consistently over here in Luke, I don't know why, but if they would have been, they, they translated it that way in Acts 16, 16 as well, where they translate it possessed. But over here, it says she had or was having or was possessing that was holding her a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. She was bowed together, could no wise lift up herself. Jesus saw her, he called her, and he said to her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. Now, we've got to understand what's been done here. Many people think that those words untied the spirit of infirmity there. It didn't happen. How do you know? Because when he said, Thou art loosed, this particular word happens to be in a perfect tense. The perfect tense expresses things that are in the past, accomplished in the past, with present results at the time of the speaking. In other words, he's saying, woman, you already have been loosed in the past with the effects at the time of speaking. Well, if she was already loosed in the past with effects at the time of speaking, and yet she was possessed by the spirit of infirmity and bowed over at that time, then what's he talking about? Because it didn't make her straight in the past. She was bowed over at that time. He's talking about the fact that this was a covenant promise, that she'd already been loosed according to the pro covenant promise. It already belonged to her because it was a covenant right of they could be free from all of these things. So he's declaring her covenant right. The other reason why, by the way, you know that this is not talking about something that actively happened at that point in time because it's passive. Otherwise, it wasn't actively happening at that point. It had already passive as something that had been done by somebody else, and it's talking about God's co the covenant of the, new, the, the old covenant that had come into manifestation, which included the right to be loosed from bondages. So, what happened? How did he get rid of this problem? He laid his hands on her. Now, what's he doing? He's releasing power into her. So he's essentially saying, covenant promise is you've already been loosed from this thing. It is an effect for you today. It happened. It's in, from the past. It has present effects. It's ready for you today to come out of this bondage. What did he do? He laid his hands upon her. He released healing power into her. And that also laying on of hands will release anointing that will drive evil spirits out as well. You'll see the scripture on that in a moment. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. So, the laying on of hands is what released the power to drive out that demon and to heal her and make her straight so she wasn't bowed over anymore. So, praise God. We come down here to verse 16, and he said, Ought not this woman be a daughter of woman? Abraham, Satan is bound these 18 years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. He did, he untied it, but how did he do it? By laying on of hands, releasing the miraculous healing power into her. We see that laying on of hands can release tremendous power <coughs> to flow in. Let's go down to Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, verse 11, it says, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Special miracles. It went through his hands. So from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. That shows you that laying on of hands, which transmits anointing and healing power, 
and power to deliver as well, to cast out demons, it can go into a handkerchief or an apron. And you can take that and lay that upon someone. <clears throat> that anointing that's transferable will cause diseases to depart from people and evil spirits will come out of them. That's exactly what when Jesus did that, that evil spirit had to come out of her and healed her and back, back in Luke chapter 11, or chapter 13, and verse 11 and following. So laying on of hands is going to release healing and anointing, and it will also release deliverance. I've seen this happen lots of times. I can remember lots of times. You go in, you just lay hands on people, and demons start coming out of them, and didn't even speak a word. Just releasing the healing power, just laying hands on people and seeing demons start coming out of them before you even started speaking anything to them. The power of God will work. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Acts 3, 1. Peter and John went together to the temple at the hour of prayer, and a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried. He laid daily at the gate of the temple, called Beautiful, asked alms of them to enter in the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asking an alms, and of course Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. He gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Of course, he was thinking about money. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. He had something that could be released out of him. He said, In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. So he spoke words in the name of Jesus, commanding words, and he took him by the right hand. So he grabbed his hand as he spoke those words and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. First he spoke those words, and as while he was doing it, that didn't bring the thing to pass. He touched him, he lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength at that point. So you speak forth, and then you release it through the laying on of hands. So your speaking releases it, but then you're going to transmit that into the person by the power of God to do great miraculous works. God wants us to be sure that when we're speaking, we also are getting our hands on people to release that power. He leaping up, stood, walked, entered the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Praise God. We also see in Acts chapter 4, they had a prayer meeting. Verse 29, they were praying, they had all the they were talking about, Lord, behold their threatenings, grant thy servants with all boldness that we may speak the word by stretching forth thine hand to heal. Now, how is he going to stretch forth his hand? This is Acts 4.30. Jesus is in heaven. How is he going to do it? He's going to do it through you and me because you and I are his hands that he operates through. That's why you've got to realize these hands are going to release the hands of Jesus Christ flowing through me, the power of God as he's come to dwell in us, he's going to flow through us that you'd stretch forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders by my name may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. So, you're going to speak in the name of Jesus. You're going to release his authority and power. You're going to release his hand to heal through your hands as you go to lay hands on him. And this is exactly what happened. You'll see. They prayed. The place was shaken together, assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They spake the word of God with boldness. Great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon him. And here's where you see the results of what happened. Over in Acts chapter 5, verse 12. By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Signs and wonders through their hands. So they spoke, that was his hands released through them to bring healing. God is going to use you. You've got to realize your hands are his hands. If you have faith and you put the release the power of God flowing through you into people, praise God. We see over in Acts chapter 14. When they came here and they spoke to the great multitude of the Jews and the Greeks believed when they were speaking the gospel to them in the synagogue of the Jews, the unbelieving Jews were stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony in the word of his grace. And granted what? Signs and wonders. That were, how are they done? By their hands. It didn't say by their words. They're going to speak the word, but the actual work is done through the hands. You speak it into being, but then you release it through the hands. Many people just speak it, and then they don't release it through the hands. We've got to understand the doctrine of laying up hands is you're going to release those things you speak into people. Get your hands on them. 
and release the healing power of God. Signs and wonders were done by their hands. Look at Acts 28, verse 8. It came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in, prayed, and laid his hands on him. He just didn't pray only. He prayed to take hold of the healing power of God, and then he laid his hands on him to release it to flow into him and healed him, and he was set free. You've got to realize there's healing in your hands. There's anointing flow in your hands. There's power that will flow through your hands. You need to believe that. This is also how people receive the Holy Spirit. You can receive it through prayer, but also remember, in fact, if we go back here, that in uh, Acts, uh, here in verse uh, 14, the apostles at Jerusalem in Acts 8 were at Jerusalem. They heard the Samaria received the word of God. They sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they prayed for him. What else did they do? Then laid they their hands on them. They prayed for them, but then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Prayer, laying on of hands, releases it. Prayer also does it. But prayer and then laying on of hands is the best way to release the Holy Spirit for them to receive the Holy Spirit to come into them. So, in fact, when Simon saw it through the laying on of hands, he saw, ah, this laying on of hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He wanted to get some money so he could make some money off of it, you know. Anybody wants to make the money off the gospel, they're, they're bad news. Get away from them, that's for sure. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we got people to do that today. Acts chapter 19, verse 2. Here's where, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Well, they, after they said they didn't even know about the Holy Spirit, and he ended up ministering the Holy Spirit to them, how did he do it? When Paul, in verse 6, when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. It got released into them through the laying on of hands. And they spake with tongues, and they prophesied. <clears throat> That also tells you that the gifts of the Holy Spirit can be released through the laying on of hands as well, because it said that they prophesied. Prophecy came forth. We see even over in Romans chapter 1, verse 11, that Paul said, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end you may be established. He wanted to impart some spiritual gift, and how would you do that? He did things through laying on of hands. That's the way he was imparting it to the people to release that. We must understand that laying on of hands is also that which is going to be imparted to go forth and to accomplish the ministry. We already saw it in the Old Testament, but we also see it in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 6, we pick up here <coughs> in verse uh, 1, when the, the, in those days the number of the disciples was multiplied, there was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. They were only taking the Hebrew widows' needs into account, and they were ignoring the Grecians, which was wrong. And so they called for seven men full of a good report that would go out and point over the business, and they said they'd give themselves to prayer and to the word, and please the whole group. And so what'd they do? They set these ones before the apostles, and when they prayed, they laid their hands on them. They just didn't pray for them and then go ahead and do it. They laid their hands on them for the release of the, the anointing for the ministry and the wisdom for the ministry. Remember, wisdom can come upon them just like Joshua had wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him for the ministry that he would need. Wisdom will come as well as the anointing for the ministry. And so they, forced, forth, of course, went forth and carried out that ministry. We see in Acts chapter 9, this is the case when it talks about Paul, who was Saul. He got converted on the way to Damascus. And the Lord spoke to a certain disciple. Remember, afterwards, he was blind. He couldn't see. There was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. He said to the, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias? He said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. The Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight. Inquire on the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. Well, that, must, that struck a chord in him. For behold, he prayeth. Well, he hears the voice of the Lord, and he, say, seen in, and he said, He's seen in a vision named Ananias come in and putting his hand on him. 
that he might receive his sight. Remember, he was blind at that point. Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard by many of the, this man how much evil he's done to the saints at Jerusalem. He has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. The Lord said, Go thy way. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. But I mean, something he was going to do also was going to help release this ministry to come into being of kings, of the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. So he goes in there and he says, I'll show you how great things he must suffer. I'll show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias obeys and goes his way. What's he do? He enters into the house and putting his hands on him. He got his hands on him. Why? He's going to release something. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, so he knew he was born again, he received the Lord. That even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now this is not talking about the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in him. Remember we've talked about the difference between the baptism and the receiving and the filling of the Holy Spirit. The, fill, the receiving of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. The filling of the Holy Spirit, if you haven't heard her teaching, you need to listen to that or read the book. The filling of the Holy Spirit is always for service. John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit for the prophet's ministry. Elizabeth and Zachar Zacharias, filled with the Spirit in prophesying. Bezalel in the Old Testament, filled with the Spirit for the ministry. Filling with the Holy Spirit is ongoing, continuous, and it's always for the service of the Lord, for ministry. So he puts his hands on him for two things. To release healing so he'd receive his sight, and also to be filled with the Holy Ghost <coughs> for the ministry. Immediately they fell forth from the eyes that had been scales and received of that forthwith, rose and was baptized. And so then now he was going to go forth and he began to preach Christ in the synagogues. The anointing of the ministry came on him immediately for him to go forth and preach the gospel. He was supposed to go and preach it. So that, that shows you that the anointing for ministry will be come forth as the hands are laid upon, not only to minister healing, but also for the anointing for ministry, and it caused a filling of the Holy Spirit, which was the anointing for the ministry that he had. We see another case where it was sending him forth in ministry. Acts chapter 13, verse 1, there were prophets and teachers there, and they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, and there was a contention between Barnabas and Saul about whether they were going to take John Mark or not, who deserted them on the first missionary journey. And they said, separate me, Paul, Barnabas and Saul for the work wherein so I called them. That was the Holy Spirit said, okay, we're going to separate this. You're going to go your way and Saul's going to go his way, which is Paul. When they fasted and prayed, what did they do? They just didn't pray and say, well, go your way, have a good trip, you know, and the blessing of God be upon you. No, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. It's a doctrine of the church. They're always laying their hands on them. What's that mean? We need to lay our hands on people to release the anointing of the ministry to be in for the power of God to operate, to bring forth what God purposes. We see a scripture over in 1 Timothy chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 14. Neglect not the gift that's in thee, which was given thee by prophecy. He had a word about this gift. With the laying on of hands by the presbytery. The elders would lay hands on him, and there was a ministry gift that came into them. He's talking of here to Timothy and tells them, don't neglect that gift that came into you. How did it get transmitted into him? A laying on of hands, not just the spoken word. It was spoken over him, but it got released through the laying on of hands. That's what we're trying to get to you. Speaking is one thing, and that's important. Laying on of hands releases and transmits that thing into a person, whether it's a gift of the Spirit, a ministry gift, a blessing, a healing, an anointing, that to bring forth um, anointing for deliverance, all these kinds of things. Now, we even see another scripture over in 2 Timothy 1.6 where he speaks again. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Hands, again, we see. The, why is this such an important doctrine? Because that's where you're going to transmit things into people's lives. God wants us to be laying hands on people to release healing. Now, some people think, well, if I lay hands on people, I might get a transfer of spirits, bad stuff. I've got to beware about who I'm laying hands on, and that's correct. You have to watch who you're laying hands on. Look what it says. 1 Timothy 5, 22. 
lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. That shows us something. If you lay hands on a person who is walking in sin, you could be a partaker of those sins and there would be a transfer of spirits that would come in from that effect. Now, what do we see a lot of ministers do out there? Everybody comes up in a prayer line, if they have a prayer line or where they have someone come up and pray, they just pray for everybody and lay hands on them and they don't even locate them. Suppose they're not even born again. Suppose they're walking in sin. Suppose they're not right with God, you know. Are you going to lay hands on that person? No. You could, suppose they're involved in witchcraft, you know. <laughs> and they just, they just want, they just, well, I, I like, I'm in witchcraft, but I want you to pray for me to get rid of my tumor or whatever all. They heard somebody, you know, that they can pray for them to get rid or cast out a demon. Hey, you don't want that. You're going to get a transfer of spirits. You've got to be sure the person is right. That tells you something. Before you lay hands on a person, you've got to be sure they're right with God. Number one, they've got to be born again. If they're not born again, you're not going to lay hands on them to release things to come into them whatsoever. They've got to be right with God first. Number two, you've got to spiritually locate and see that they're right with God and the fact that they certain are having, walking with the Lord correctly. If they're walking in sin, are you going to minister to them and release the healing power of God or deliverance? No. They've got to be right with God. You've got to spiritually locate them, is what I refer to at first. Find out where they're at. Like I've had several cases here, maybe three or four, three I guess as I can think of, that come since I've been here and others in the past, <clears throat> but since we've been here that have come and they wanted deliverance. They had problems in their body and in discussing with them found out that they were presently living in fornication with someone in, in an ongoing fornication relationship and they just wanted to get healed of their problem. <laughs> now, if I would have laid hands on them without finding that out, I could have had a transfer of spirits coming into me, and I would have. And I could have been a partaker of other men's sins. So what do I do? That's why. What do I do all the time? I, you come up for deliverance, what do I say? Hey, let's make an appointment. I want to sit down and talk to you. I want to explain deliverance with you so you can understand, answer your questions, be sure you understand this. I want to talk to you about the problems in your life so I know everything. In the meantime, I'm going to find out, are you walking right? or not. And the Holy Spirit will be showing you and revealing things to you and being sure that a person's walking right or not. You know, and they find out, of course, when I found that out, I said, well, you're not a candidate for deliverance until you get rid of that. You know, this is sin. You do need to confess your sins and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteous and repent and turn away from it. You know, and unfortunately, in all three of those cases, uh, they left. I never saw them again. They never, they never, they must not have dealt with their problem. <laughs> I said, you go deal with your problem and get rid of it and come back. I'll be glad to minister to you, but you've got to get right with God. You can't continue in that relationship. So you've got to spiritually locate people first. So you don't just go and lay hands on someone without being sure they're right with God. Otherwise, you could get a transfer of spirits coming into you. And that has happened to people. Now, this, on the other hand, should I be afraid that I might get a, sp a transfer of spirits? No, because the power of God is resonant in you, and if you are right with God, you're not going to have anything coming into you at all if you have done what you need to do. Say, well, yeah, they've confessed their sin, but they got witchcraft in them. They've been involved in that in the past. Are they involved in it now? No. Have they confessed their sins? Sure. Are they not, they're not working it now, no. Well, they're spirits, they could come into me, and I think they might come into me. So people will get kind of paranoid about that. No, they're not going to be able to come into you unless they are abiding in sin and you have, you've, you've violated the scriptures by doing what he says not to do. You don't just go lay hands on someone, and why do you lay hands on? To release some spiritual thing, healing, deliverance, or power. And you, otherwise, you've got to be sure they're right with God, first of all. You've got to keep yourself pure. So, there's no danger in laying on of hands. Now, some people I see, well, I don't want to lay hands on them, so I'll just kind of put my hands up this over their head or we're near them. That's not what you want to do. God doesn't say put your hands over their head or, you know, just kind of a distance and, you know, kind of these kind of deals. No. He said lay your hands on them. But spiritually locate them first. Get your hands on that person. Lay hands on them, of course, in discreet places, never in wrong places. Lay your hands on them and release healing power. Don't be afraid to not lay hands on them, thinking that I might get a transfer of spirit to something that's in them. Spirits will not come into you if they're right with God and you're right with God. Of course, you've got to be sure you're right with God 
you know, if you're not right with God, hey, you could, you could, get, you could have problems. In fact, you know, have no business laying hands on anybody if you're not right with God yourself. So be sure you've confessed your sins. Now, does that mean, well, I can't lay, can I lay hands on people if I haven't gotten all the demons out? Sure you can. You know, if that's the case, we could, none of us could pray for anybody because none of us have gotten all the demons out yet. We're a work in progress, all of us. But if you've confessed your sin, you're right, because healing power is going to flow through the spirit. The demons are in the soul and the body. They're not going to be transferring, and they're not going to be affecting you. Some people say, well, will the demons in me hinder the power of God from flowing out of me if I lay hands on someone? No, because where's the power of God coming out of? The spirit. Not coming from your soul or body. It's coming from the spirit. You can have s demons in you in your soul and body, and you can release the healing power of God or gifts of the Spirit or whatever, and it will flow into that person and accomplish the work even though you have a problem in your own life. So you could even be sick, have a sickness in you because you're fighting a battle or come trying to drive something out and go lay hands on someone and God can minister healing and, and restore, you know, get them set free even though you're having battling a problem at the present time because it's releasing it from the Spirit. So... Don't ever back off of laying on of hands because you think that, well, i got a problem in me, so I guess I can't lay hands on someone, or God can't release healing through me. No, it's coming out of your spirit. <clears throat> There's no evil in your spirit. <clears throat> as long as you're right with the Lord, you are ready to lay hands on people. <clears throat> and God wants to stretch forth His hands through you. You are going to go forth. You've got hands that will release the healing power of God. You need to understand that. You need to have faith in that. And remember, we saw many cases where they spoke, where Jesus spoke, but then he did something else to release it. They would prophesy, but then they released it through the laying on of hands, that gift that came into them. So, you got hands. God wants you to get your hands praying for people. When you pray for them, pray for them and say, hey, I want to lay hands on you too, to release the healing power of God to flow into you. That's a doctrine of the church. Hold your hands up. You've got hands. These are holy hands. God wants you to use these hands to transmit and minister the healing power of God. Pray this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for my hands that are to transmit the anointing, the blessing, the healing power, the delivering power to impart things into other people. I thank you, Lord. I will be sure that I have clean hands because I confess my sin and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. And I understand the doctrine of the laying on of hands. And I'm going to get my hands releasing healing power and a blessing and anointing into people's lives as I pray for them and speak the word. I'm going to get my hands laid upon them to impart that healing, to release that healing, to transmit the power of God, to see people set free. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to get my hands on people as I'm speaking the word, or praying the word, or casting out the demons. And I thank you for using me mightily to do healings, to cast out demons, to do signs and wonders and miraculous works. Thank you for using me mightily to do the works of God through my hands. As you extend yourself through my hands, your hands will flow, releasing the power of God. Thank you, Lord, for using me mightily as I lay hands and transmit and release the healing power of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the doctrine of laying on of hands. Praise God. So, always remember that. Get your hands on people when you pray for them. Don't just pray for them only. If they're in your presence, you get your hands on them. And release. And your faith is always, I'm releasing what I'm praying into them. You're doing, you're speaking it, but you're going to release it through that contact. There's something about contact. That's what Jesus did, and that's what you and I are to do. That's what they did in the book of Acts, and that's what God wants to do for you and through you. Praise God.
Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you brought for it. We thank you for the doctrine of laying on of hands. We're going to operate in it. And we'll be sure that we locate people spiritually before we do this. We won't make mistakes and be partaker of other men's sins. We'll be sure that we only lay hands on people that are right with you and that will release the power of God in them to have covenant relationship because they're born again. Thank you, Father, for using us mightily to release the power of God and to see the mighty works be done through our hands as we obey and fulfill the doctrine of the laying on of hands. Thank you for much fruit as we do your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.